Back now with our uh, panel, Gwen Eiffel, of course, is the co-anchor of the PBS NewsHour, moderator of Washington Week. We want to welcome Robert Costa, covers Congress for the Washington Post, spends a lot of time chasing down news on Capitol Hill, along with our congressional correspondent, Nancy Cordes. But uh, I must say, Robert, you're getting all the, <laughs> the uh, congratulations this week because you were the one reporter that went down to Richmond and reported that uh, there was real trouble brewing down there for Eric Cantor. And uh, I went back and read your story, and it reads better today than it did even back then. You, you really nailed this. Uh, you heard Wright's uh, Priebus just now. He says that Republicans are united. He's trying to kind of uh, say this was just local politics down there, and, and was, there was not really a lesson for Republicans there, if I understood it. What's your take? Well, what I heard from the chairman was a party that's still reeling from the defeat of Eric Cantor. And they're trying to project confidence ahead of the midterm elections. Yet right now, the loss of Eric Cantor means much more than just the defeat of someone in their own Richmond district. Eric Cantor was the, the standard bearer, the chief messenger for the party ahead of November. With him out, the party is unstable. They're trying to find a path ahead on immigration. And right now, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure they know where to go. They're still grappling with a strategy and a message. Glenn, uh, Gwen, do you think this was good news or bad news for Democrats? I mean, there were some loud cheers from the Democratic side at of first. the aisle at first, but then people began to think, well, maybe maybe this is not so good for I, us. I talked to somebody at the White House yesterday who said it kind of went from shock, they were speechless, to kind of schadenfreude, ha ha, our enemy goes down, and then to, well, wait a second, what did we lose here? We lost a guy who who was never on either side in immigration. He tried to have it both ways. So it doesn't necessarily, and they still wanted to get something done on immigration this year. So after getting over the immediate, ah, my, our enemy has fallen, they began to realize this wasn't really good news for Democrats. And it's not great news for incumbents. Because if you are in Washington and America is voting against Washington, it, your party identification matters, matters a whole lot less. So there's some uncertainty about what this means among Democrats. What is this gonna mean to uh, Republicans up on the Hill? Nancy. Well, I think they're all, as Gwen said, a little bit nervous right now. Initially, there was this excitement among Tea Party members. Oh, wow, look, David has slayed Goliath. But very quickly, I think they realized, wait a minute, Goliath sided with us almost all the time, not always, but a lot. And there's some uncertainty about what the new leadership team will look like and whether it will be as favorable to them as the past leadership. Does this help Speaker Boehner or does it hurt him? Do you see the Republicans becoming more conservative? Uh, in their outlook on Capitol Hill or less so? Well, the ironic thing is that given all the belly aching that conservatives had expressed over the past several years about the fact that there wasn't a true red state conservative in leadership, when this vacuum suddenly appeared, your standard bearers among conservatives didn't jump in and say, okay, I want to be the next majority leader. Most of them decided to stay away. And partly that reflects the fact that the challenge of being a Republican leader right now is that the conservatives demand purity from you, but you still have to work with the other side from time to time. So it's hard to hang on to that mental of a pure conservative once you're a member of leadership. What about immigration, Robert? Do you see any chance of any kind of immigration bill coming out of the House this year? I stayed outside of the Republican Study Committee's Wednesday meeting at the Capitol, and, and every single member I asked on the conservative side of things said no chance for immigration this year. I think this was really a lost opportunity for the Tea Party as well. They had the power to take down Eric Cantor, but they were powerless to replace him. Kevin McCarthy, currently the whip, is looking to easily ascend now to become the next majority leader. Where are the Tea Party leaders in Congress? They seem disorganized right now to try to walk into that vacuum and take power. You know, Gwen, uh, listening to, uh, to Wright's Priebus and having listened to uh, Lindsey Graham earlier in the broadcast, uh, Priebus says they're all united and everything, but if you listen to what Lindsey Graham said and you listen to what uh, Priebus said, there's a great divide here. There, and there's even a divide among Tea Party conservatives because, as we know, there's not really a leader of the Tea Party, There's, or else they would have been able to seize some sort of leadership role in Congress. They're all over the place. But if you are a good candidate, like Lindsey Graham was in South Carolina, who saw his challenge coming, if you're a good candidate, like Mitch McConnell was in Missouri, who, in Kentucky, who saw his candidate, his, his challenge coming, you position yourself so that you don't get taken down by the random Tea Party candidate. Unfortunately, if you are Thad Cochran in Mississippi or you are Eric Cantor in Virginia and you don't see it coming, you're not positioned to take it down. So it's not that, so the Tea Party is strengthened, but they're not, they don't to do with the strength. And the, and the, and the middle uh, of the road establishment 
is shaken and they don't quite know how to get their feet. I mean, we saw the, the stocks tumble for Boeing this week with Eric Cantor lost. So they all obviously understood they lost an ally. There is a, there is a, if anybody who says that there's not a lot of soul searching going on is not listening. You know, I think we have several Republican parties right now. I think we have a House Republican Party. And these are people, most of whom do not have uh, very many Hispanics in their district and voting against mm -hmm. uh, immigration reform is an easy vote mm -hmm. for a House Republican right now. But then you have people like uh, Lindsey Graham, people are looking at it from the national level who say, look, the demographics in this country are changing. There's no way we're ever going to elect a president uh, if you can only get 27 percent of this fast growing uh, demographic here. And it's amusing how many press releases I've gotten from people running for Congress this week who are claiming to be the next Dave Bratt. Everyone is trying to claim the mantle of Dave Bratt. Who and brought they down, could be. Who knows? You, you know, they could be. And immigration was his big issue. But I think the bigger challenge for Eric Cantor was not the fact that he was for immigration reform or against it, but that people didn't really know where he stood. First, he came out very forcefully against immigration. Then he said he was for it for the kids. And then he's backed away from that when it looked like that was unpopular. So I think the challenge for people in his district on not just that issue, but a number of issues with it. They weren't really sh quite sure where he's You know, Robert, you, you probably know more about this than the rest of us because you have spent time in that district. But this is going to bring new meaning to faculty politics because <laughs> here Brandt, who's an economics professor at Randolph-Macon College, and it turns out the Democrat in this race is also a professor at Randolph-Macon College, this little school of, what, 1,500 people. It's better than getting in the final four. But does he have any chance at all, or is this just such a heavily Republican district. That, I spoke uh, with Tom Bliley, Cantor's uh, predecessor there, and he said this is mainly a Republican district. It, it will stay that way. And I think the point about immigration is an important one. Who now has the political capital inside the House GOP to actually move immigration forward? When I talked to members on Friday night, they said only two people, John Boehner and Paul Ryan. And among, with all this unrest, will they move forward? Doubtful. Here's the good news, though, for the Republicans, and John Boehner is seized on it. And he, sometimes we stop listening to him because he says it all the time. He's very consistent, and that's that Republicans may disagree with each other about th things within the party, but they agree that they are unhappy about Barack Obama. They agree that they believe that Democrats are taking the country on a very bad path. You look at this new Pew poll that came out this week, which showed polarization. There is such anger and such division that the Republicans know that, that they can focus on what they agree on, and that's what John Boehner did. He pivoted immediately to mm -hmm. talking about what was wrong with the president. Let me ask you quickly about Iraq. Yes. Uh, if the president does decide to go to Congress uh, to ask if, uh, if he decides he wants airstrikes, will mm -hmm. he, will they approve that? You know, there is no consensus in Iraq right now about what the U.S. should do. I asked Speaker Boehner this week, does he think that the U.S. should launch airstrikes? He says he doesn't have enough in information to make that decision, but all he knows is that the president is taking a nap. Uh, if the president does ask for Congress's approval, he's going to have to do a better job than a year ago when he asked for approval to launch airstrikes in Syria. He was resoundingly defeated that time. He's going to have to make a very strong case for what he wants to do and what it will accomplish. All right. Well, I want to thank all of you, and we'll stay tuned as it were. What a week we've had. Uh, we'll be back in a moment.